Chapter 5. Um, okay, and I need to give context, you already know it, uh, but where are we at in the flow of things? Well, uh, the previous chapters, 2 through 4, what we talked about last night, were, we could put a, a big category over those three chapters and say, the conversion of Nebuchadnezzar, right? I mean, we saw the progress of God bringing him from basically him being, and we could conclude one in that really, introduced to the God of Israel, and then coming to greater understanding, greater understanding, <clears throat> finally repenting and humbly putting himself below the sovereignty of God, the God of Israel. So that's where we've come to, uh, and we've, we've got to get the transition here, okay? The last words of this chapter I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of Heaven, for all his works are truth, his ways are just, and the ones who walk in pride he is able to humble. Okay? Those words. The ones who walk in pride he is able to humble. Next chapter, we're going to talk about a guy who is incredibly arrogant, and God humbled him. God humbled him when he died. That's how he got humbled. Okay? And, and, and this very much then, chapter 4 and 5, forms a contrast, okay, that you could think of it like this, um, you really have the same condition, an arrogant man, I'll even draw a picture of a man, that's for free, uh, we have an arrogant man, and, and the same condition, God brings in judgment on this person, and he's working on them, and that person can respond either by humbly submitting themselves, okay, they can humble themselves, or they can be judged. Those are the two choices. That's all you have to pick from. Okay. And so chapter 4, we're talking about a person who humbled himself. Started the same way, arrogant guy. I mean, actually, in his case, we have to start all the way back in chapter 2, because he, he's slowly learning. Uh, but he's an uh, arrogant guy who made the choice to humble himself. Over here, we have chapter 5. We have the example of a person who chose not to humble himself. Okay, now let's talk about what that looks like in terms of outcomes. Belshazzar the king. Belshazzar the king made a great face, feast for a thousand of his nobles and was drinking wine before the thousand. Um, you know what? Um, let's go ahead and do what we did last night with one of the chapters because this is a perfect chapter to do it. Let's divide this up again. Uh, and I'd say you don't have to. Certainly if someone's not real comfortable with reading out loud, no need. But uh, I'd say if you didn't get the chance to read last night, this would be a perfect time to do it if you're comfortable with it. So I hope if, uh, if you didn't get to, you'll jump at the chance now. I'll need a narrator. I will need Belshazzar. I will need the queen. And I will need the, uh, Daniel. I think that's all I need. The narrator, Belshazzar, the queen, and Daniel. If we wanted to, uh, we could have someone be the lord, which would be you would just read these big old words. Uh, but they're kind of scary words. Maybe I'll read those words. I'll be the one who does those. Okay, so I'd you, love to be the queen. Yeah, I was going to suggest. Why don't you take the queen? Perfect. Um, and Logan, you, did you do one last time? Very short one. You're on. Okay, how about, you want to be the narrator? Sure. Good, okay. You'll get a lot, nice long part. Adam has to still play tonight. Okay, all right. This is funny. Okay, so your voice was popular apparently last time. At least popular with one person. Yeah, well, yeah, the whole time. Well, that's okay, you got two. You got two. Official. All right, no, you've got two, I'm sorry. Yeah. Somebody joined you, though. Yeah. All right, so um, Adam, how about you take uh, Daniel? That'll be good. You want to do that? You'll have to change voices, though. Yeah, you're not allowed doing the same. No, no. Okay, it's going to be different. This guy, the Daniel is old, so we're looking for an old man voice. Humble. Humble. Yeah. Okay. All right, we need uh, we need the king. <laughs> Big standard. <laughs> Were you? Did you speak last night? I did. You did. Okay. Anybody? Last time. Anybody else who did not want to do it, you don't need to. But all right, you're the king. Great. Let's Let's start. Let's go. All right. Belshazzar the king made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in the presence of the thousand. While he tasted the wine, Belshazzar gave the command to bring the gold and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple which had been in Jerusalem, that the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken from the temple of the house of God, which had been in Jerusalem, and the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze and iron, wood and stone. In the same hour, the fingers of a man's hand appeared and wrote opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. 
Then the king's countenance changed, and his thoughts troubled him, so that the joints of his hips were loosened, and his knees knocked against each other. The king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. The king spoke, saying to the wise men of Babylon, Whoever reads this writing and tells me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck, and he shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Now all the king's wise men came, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king its interpretation. Then King Belshazzar was greatly troubled, his countenance was changed, and his lords were astonished. The queen, because of the words of the king and his lords, came to the banquet hall. The queen spoke, saying, O king, live forever. Do not let your, tr your thoughts trouble you, nor let your countenance change. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy God. And in the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdoms of wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, <laughs> with the French accent, your father, um, your father the king made him chief of the magicians, astrologers, <coughs> Chaldeans, and soothsayers. And as much as an excellent spirit, knowledge, understanding, interpreting dreams, solving riddles and explaining enigmas were found in this Daniel whom the king named Belshazzar. Now let Daniel be called and he will give the interpretation. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Are you that Daniel who is the one of the captives from Judah whom my father the king brought from Judah? I have heard of you that the spirit of God is in you and that the light of uh, uh, and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men, the astrologers, and have been brought in before me that they should read this writing and make known to me its interpretation. But they could not give the interpretation of the thing. And I have heard of you that you can give interpretations and explain enigmas. Now if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around your neck, and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let your gifts be for yourself, and give your rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing to the king, and make known him the interpretation. O king, the Most High God gave Nebuchadnezzar your father, a kingdom and majesty, glory and honor. And because of the majesty that he gave him, all peoples, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whomever he wished, he executed. Whomever he wished, he kept alive. Whomever he wished, he set up. And whomever he wished, he put down. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hard in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne, and they took him his glory from him. Then he was driven from the sons of men, his heart was made like the beast, and his dwelling was that of wild donkeys. They fed him with the grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till he knew that the Most High God rules in the kingdom of men, and appoints it over whom he chooses. But you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, although you knew this, and you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. They have brought the vessels of his house before you, and you and your lords, your wives, and your concubines have drunk wine from them, and you have praised the gods of silver and of gold, and bronze and of iron, wood and stone, which you not see or hear or know. And the God who holds your breath in his hands and owns all your ways, you have not glorified. Then the hands were sent from him, and his writings was written. Oh, that's fine. And this is the writing which was inscribed. Mene, Mene, Teko, Ufarsin. So, narrator. Oh. No, no problem. I thought of Daniel interpreting. Yes. This is the interpretation of each word. It is Daniel. My apologies. Oh, Go ahead. Okay. Carry on, narrator. Uh, the, the guy up here misled you. Me? Yeah. Daniel. Go for it. This is the interpretation of each word. Khmene. God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. <laughs> you have been weighed in the balances and have found wanting. Paris. Paris. As they say in English. Your kingdom has been divided and given to Medes and Persians. Then Belshazzar... Oh, okay. 
Then Belshazzar gave the command, and they clothed David or Daniel with purple and put a chain of gold around his neck, and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain. Ah! And <laughs> I thought I was reading your part for a <laughs> And Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. I kind of knew I would do that from the beginning. <laughs> awesome. Well, Did he sound Weasley enough? He sounded very Weasley. It was excellent. It was great. You sounded quite Spanish. Though. Nicely done. Yeah. I liked your sound. Not enough in the tackle, though. <laughs> I was going to start it off the whole time like Jewish, but I was like, <laughs> How do you do that? Well, it's difficult. You sound like Mel Brooks with a ha. <laughs> well, great. Very good job. Um, so let's let's jump in, I mean, and get some of these details that are here. Uh, first thing to hit, Belshazzar the king. Ancient sources give us some information about this guy. Uh, it's possible that Belshazzar may have been involved in a plot to assassinate the previous king. It, historically, we do know uh, it went like this. Nebuchadnezzar, then another king, uh, a very um, insignificant king, followed by Belshazzar. Okay, I'll have to get a little more detail about that last part. But this, this middle guy that came between Belshazzar and uh, Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar, this midi- middle guy was assassinated through a plot. It was a coup. And there's a possibility that Belshazzar may have been involved from it. In fact, uh, it is more clear that he did profit financially from it. And he also may have been involved in getting uh, his father in place as the king, um, since he knew, or uh, that he was able to get his father in his king because he knew his dad was old and his dad would die soon, which would bring the kingdom to him. Basically, all I'm saying, and there's a lot of history there that's not, it's extra biblical, but he was a scoundrel. <laughs> That's my point. Kill off one guy, get your dad in, because you know your dad's old and he'll die soon, and I'll get the money out of it or be the king myself. Uh, he was involved in a plot at one point with one of his generals. He's out with the son of the general, and they're hunting, and he got jealous apparently or something. Anyway, he just killed off this other guy. Just killed him in cold blood. And that enters into the story a little bit later. Um, so... What's going on here? The text doesn't get into those kinds of details, but we can say historically this guy was a scoundrel. And I can say, what's more, he was very un- unpopular within the city of Babylon. Quite unpopular. Uh, one other thing you need to know about Belshazzar the king, he is co-regent at this point. Okay? There's a, another man, Nabonidus, who is reigning his father. And uh, that Nabonidus... Um, is the actual king, and then Belshazzar is working like as the second, the co-king or something. Co-regencies were very common, so they're overlapping, reigning together. So it's completely right to call uh, Belshazzar the king. He is the king. He has that title. But just so you know, he's not the only king, okay? He's working together with his his father, who at this point, uh, you know, is a a rather elderly man. Logan? Well, I was just going to ask, like, the person that he possibly would conspire to kill if he was related to him. Like, was it his own father? I was going to ask if it was his own father, but you no. answered that one. Right. But was, were they related in some way? Yeah. No. I mean, there's no indication oh. that they were. Yeah. Anything else? No? Um, and here's one of the things that you have to, you have to think about, too, and it's, we're not sure how all this fits together. Later on, he is, it is mentioned uh, that he says, Belshazzar, your father, Okay. Uh, or Nebuchadnezzar, your father. Um, it's not, we know this for certainty, Belshazzar was not the direct son of Nebuchadnezzar. In other words, it wouldn't be like my dad to me. Okay, we're not talking about that. And you have to know as well, the Hebrew word ab, which means father, uh, there is no word for grandfather or great-grandfather or anything like that. They just use ab for all of it. Okay, So ab could be your father, could be your grandfather, could be your great-grandfather, your great-great-grandfather any of those. That's why you see some of the times in the Old Testament, they'll say, our father Abraham. Okay? It just means our ancestor Abraham, because there's no word for our great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandfather, or something like that. You know? So they just say father for all of it. We just add great. <laughs> yeah, you just right, keep on saying that. You're right, so he is the great, um, he is the, the grandfather of Belshazzar? Maybe. 
And that, that introduces us to the next thing. Uh, the queen in the story, um, she, from what we can tell, uh, we don't know all the details of, of who that is, but she was very possibly, could have been, it's, just, it's guesswork, but we have history that maybe would suggest she might have been uh, one of Nebuchadnezzar's wives. Okay, So um, if that's the case, and we do know this as well, Nabonidus, when he came to the throne, the man that uh, Belshazzar is, is working with, his dad, Nabonidus went and married one of Nebuchadnezzar's wives. Okay, So this woman may be the mother of Belshazzar. In other words, Belshazzar may be descended directly from Nebuchadnezzar through his mom, who also happens to be married to the man who is his dad, technically his stepdad, Nabonidus. Okay, is that complicated enough? Also, it's not, it's not his wife that speaks, it's maybe his mother. Exactly, yeah. It's more likely his mother. Uh, well, it's, yeah, it, it's, it yeah, is more likely because... because was, there was one part where it was pointed out that the queen was with him, and that this had to have been some other person. Uh, that probably, like you said, um, comes from a different, but maybe it is his mother rather than his wife. Hmm. Yeah, she's not really in the group of the wives and concubines. And yeah, that's one of the facts. Is In the beginning of the verse, it says uh, that he had all his wives and his concubines drink wine. Well, she comes in later, doesn't she? Hmm. So she's not part of that party. So that's the one argument. Um, and then the other argument is that she seems to remember something that the other people don't remember. So it inclines us to think she's a little older and she's been around a little while uh, for her to be able to have that connection back there. Yeah. I think like what helped me was the fact that Belshazzar knew of the things that happened before. You know, he kind of plays the dumb card in uh -huh. the beginning. Yeah. But like later on when I was listening to it, I was like, he knew everything. Yeah. Like he knew of Daniel. He yeah. knew of, of what his father went through or his grandfather. Yeah. Yeah, later on, and we'll get to this, later on, Daniel, speaking to him, says, you didn't, you didn't obey these things, even though you knew all this. And we'll see what he's talking about from this. Uh, so Belshazzar did know a little bit more than you necessarily that on. You have to take into account he's probably drunk. Um, so there's sort of, that's part of the factor. <laughs> you know, as an inebriated, maybe he's like, ah, oh, not thinking about, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, Daniel. You know, and so you don't know to what extent that's going on. Um, so, but maybe he's just, I, who knows, who knows why he's not calling Daniel. Um, so just so I clarify here again, uh, we have Nebuchadnezzar and possibly, uh, the queen mother. And then there's, uh, we'll say just King two, all right, the second King who died. And in his place now, Nabonidus took over the throne, working together with his stepson, Belshazzar and Nabonidus may have married the queen mother, okay? So that then would be the queen mother may have been the mother of Belshazzar, all right? And this then may, could be, he could be Nebuchadnezzar's son. He could be uh, even Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. We just, we don't know how, you know, we don't know how those things relate, okay? Sorry, who may have married the queen? Uh, Nabonidus. Oh, okay. The, the other guy who's not mentioned in the story uh, who is co-regent together with Belshazzar. I happen to mention this as one point because it will come up later, and it's a matter of note. It's just interesting. Belshazzar was not represented in the archaeological evidence. There was no record of Belshazzar. And so the liberals have a lot of fun with that because they say Daniel, um, this pseudonymous author, of course, that's the way they always want to go with it, the pseudonymous author writing in the second century, uh, he didn't know his history and he just made somebody up. And so he should have known that the true king was not Belshazzar, the true king was Nabonidus. And so we know that, we're smart, and the a foolish author Daniel did not. And you can find books today that make that argument and so forth. A little problem happened, they dug up another tablet, and the tablet mentioned Belshazzar and designated that he reigned during the time of Nabonidus. Okay? And so suddenly all the liberal, you know, the way of throwing rocks at the book of Daniel, now they looked pretty foolish, didn't they? Uh, because they doubted this historical record, and God demonstrated, yes, of course, this is true. Uh, so people don't people don't make that argument anymore. It's fallen rather silent, hasn't it? Because they found a dug up a tablet that proved this. At least scholarly, sadly, those things still get perpetuated to like the layman. Like, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, that we'll talk. What we'll talk about later is that there's other things that they say now. 
okay, other ones, and, and we'll talk about those a bit later on. Uh, but this is one of a number of places where in the Bible, uh, you know, the professional scholars criticize the Bible for a period of time, and then, oops, they found some records that demonstrate that the Bible was right. Um, so that's a little bit about the background with Belshazzar. Uh, command, uh, he, he, he's there, he's having a great feast with a thousand of his nobles drinking wine. When they tasted the wine, uh, this expression may refer to basically when he'd had a lot of wine when he's drunk. Okay, That may be what's expressed by that. Uh, so possibly when he's starting to get tipsy, he commanded for them to bring the vessels of gold and silver, which Nebuchadnezzar, his father, uh, and I said predecessor. I should have mentioned this as well. Another possibility is that the word ab is used of basically your predecessor in the hierarchy, in the lineage, okay, in the di dynasty, I should say. Um, and so if you're king number four, and this guy was king number one or king number two, he's called your Ab because he came before you in the, in the dynasty. And that's another possibility. We may, they may not be related at all. It may just be that he was the predecessor. I suggest that he was related, but ultimately we don't know. Okay, so uh, bring out the vessels of gold and silver which Nebuchadnezzar had brought out from the temple so that the king and his nobles and his wives and his concubines might drink from them. Okay, the book started you out with that. And it's we read right over this. I did comment on, on it at the time because it, uh, it wasn't part of the chapter that we were going to comment on. But isn't it fascinating? Way back here in chapter 1, verse 2, the author specifically recorded this detail for you. And we just read over it. I mean, it fits exactly into the flow of the passage because this first part of the passage, I would say the point of this first two verses is to demonstrate a tragedy has happened. This is a catastrophe. God's people have been taken into captivity. Worse, all known, also the vessels of the temple were taken into captivity, which almost represents, it's kind of like in the ancient mind to some extent, Israel's God has been taken into captivity. That's why Nebuchadnezzar would want to do this. Let's go take all their stuff. If we have idols, let's take them too. Oh, these guys just have vessels. Fine, we'll take those. Okay. And, and so you are already aware of the fact as a reader that the vessels have been carried down to the, house of, to the land of Shinar, to the house of Nebuchadnezzar's gods, and placed in the treasure house of his <coughs> gods. So that when you get to chapter 5 and this detail gets mentioned, oh, bring out the vessels of gold and silver that we brought out from Jerusalem. Now, I have to stop here and give a little bit of background for this story and some of what's going on. This is the only story of the book where we have a specific date we can associate with it. The other ones I've given you a year, okay? But look at this. Chapter 5 happened October 12th, 539. What? Of course, they didn't do our, they didn't do October as a name back then. This is a Roman thing. Um, but that we can, you know, if you do the chronology and all that, it would line up with what would be our October. It's October 12, 539. That's nine. Actually, it's the night of October 12, 539. <laughs> highly specific. The reason we know that is because there are two different historians, ancient historians, that record this story, the fall of Babylon. Okay? They don't, they're, they're not talking about all this, of course, uh, but what they're talking about is the end of it, where Belshazzar was slain and the, and, and the fall of Babylon happened. Okay, and we know that specific date. We also know a little bit of background about that. And what had happened was, over time, Babylon was weakening. Okay, it's an old power. It's been there for at this point uh, for 87 years. And so over time, it's starting to weaken. The Medes and the Persians are starting to get stronger and stronger, and they're kind of nipping at the heels of Babylon. And then at one point, uh, it, it, as they're battling, there's a very significant battle that happened where... Babylon just got destroyed, like thoroughly routed. Okay, Nabonidus, the other guy, the other king, fled before his army. He did escape, uh, but he runs. The army is just destroyed. And the result of that was that me, the Medes and the Persians had been able to take over almost the entire kingdom of Babylon. Okay, For all practical intents and purposes, all that was left was the city of Babylon itself. Now, you have to know a little bit about the city of Babylon as that stands. The city of Babylon would have been one of the most well-defended cities in the history of the ancient world. Okay? It had two different layers of walls. I think the number is 40 feet tall. The walls were so wide you could drive a chariot across the top of it. Wow. They actually dug a moat around the outside to make the walls even higher from the outside. So you'd have to get up that too. And then you had this second, so this would be water. 
or at, at probably just empty. But uh, then inside of that, you've got another wall within the city. So it's a wall within a wall. In other words, if you want to conquer Babylon, you have to break through this wall. And this is a very high wall and a very thick wall. Then you've got to break through that wall too. And you're just not going to do it. It's just not going to happen. And of course, naturally, when it's defended like this, they've got soldiers all through here on the outside wall and soldiers all through here on the inside wall. Okay, and where do you think the palace is? It's going to be in the middle. Okay. Now, another thing about the city. Cool. Yes. Oh, I thought I heard it coming. Um, another thing about the city is that how would you get into that city like this typically? Well, generally, just given warfare it was, it was, it's not like you're going to fly planes over it or drive a tank up to it or something. Uh, so you don't get into a city like this. You generally would just put it in siege, right? And this, we have records of this multiple places in the Bible where this is exactly how they did it. Put a siege around the city, nothing goes in, nothing comes out. And then if you wait long enough, eventually the people get hungry and they come out, right? That's the way you solve this problem. Well, Babylon had its own river. It has its own river coming in, and it has food stored up for 20 years worth. Okay. So, um, you know, after 20 years, it's not going to be good food, but it's going to be food. <laughs> All right. Um, they're, they're able to make it for 20 years. And obviously then, there goes having a siege, right? I mean, you're not going to wait around for 20 years and wait for this city to fall. It's just too time intensive. And so, basically, if you're in the city, you're good, pretty much, right? I mean, what's to worry about? Putting that in context, then, this is the night. After, I mean, this is within a couple of days, uh, not, not more than two weeks for sure, that from when the time this great battle had happened, okay? And the city is entirely surrounded by the Medo Persian army, okay? And, and therefore, Nebuchadnezzar, or pardon me, Belshazzar is caged up in the city and he can't go anywhere, right? And it's that night that Belshazzar chooses to throw a party. You think, now that's really weird, isn't mm -hmm. it? But, you know, I had always read this chapter, okay, they just had a party, you know, was it somebody's birthday party or it was just a celebration or something. It, there was, one of the historians records, uh, there was uh, a, like a traditional holiday that they were celebrating that night. But we also can surmise that part of having this celebration was kind of part of a way of saying, we're fine, you know? I mean, we're surrounded by an army, and they think they're going to defeat us and kill us, but... We're not worried. We're going to have a party. Let's just do it, right? What are we worried about? And, and in that sense, then, this was a way of shaking your fist right in the face of the people who think they're going to defeat you. It's a way of stating total, utter confidence. It may also be a way for Belshazzar of increasing morale, okay? Because everybody in the city, they look over the walls. They see what's going on out there. They're afraid. They're nervous. Come on. We're going to have a party. What are we afraid of? kind of get people excited and on board with them, and uh, hopefully, you know, be able to continue to maintain power inside the city. I just also noticed that they said they praised the gods of gold and silver. Oh, so. come on, don't take away my excitement here. I'm headed there. I'm... Well, yeah, so it could be something not ritualistic, I would say, but it could be maybe possibly incorporated towards them. Because I don't know, like, the exact way pagans always pray, but they yep. didn't have the prayer connection that we did, obviously. They yep. were a little yep. debauched with it, right? Yep. So I was just maybe... Yeah. Well, and it's good. I, I'm teasing you, of course, uh, about not saying anything. I, I, there is a very definite connection here as well. Uh, I've already mentioned to you a couple of times the idea that if my people beat your people, that means my God be, beat your God, right? And so, okay, that's why we bring the, the, the vessels of the temple home back to Babylon. It's kind of like our trophy case. We put it in the big glass cabinet right at the front door. So everybody walks, walks through and sees, look at all the people we conquered, right? These are the trophies we bring back. And it's a way of saying, look, ha, we trounced. We trounced the Hebrews. We trounced their God. Okay? Well, if you have a party in a night when everybody is surrounding you, okay, you're surrounded and you can't get out, but you say... They can't beat us. What's the point of dragging out all the items, the implements, whatever, from all the other people's temples? Okay? So if we conquer them, we will conquer you. Exactly. It's a way of saying, just remember, we beat them all these times. You know, maybe a coach of a sports team, all right? They've won, like, six championships, and now they're in another championship, and he wants to get his guys excited. So he brings them out there, and he, he says, look, guys, look in the trophy case. Remember this year? Remember that year? Remember that year? 
Okay? Let's bring out the, the vessels. And we're going to have a party, and while we're at it, let's go ahead and we'll drink from the vessels, which is a way of saying, oh, we beat the God of the Hebrews. Ha ha, right? Cheers to us. We, we trounced him. And, and there's an irony in this. They, they're drinking from these gold and silver vessels taken from the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem. They're drinking from them, and they're praising the gods of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Okay? You, 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 this is the, the foolishness of it. You seriously are praising a God that is just physical and material. Okay? It doesn't make much sense, does it? Um, I don't even remember if it was here or if it was the fast class. Did I tell you the story about the guy I met in Zambia and I talked to him about idolatry? Okay, I'm, I'm in the, stop me if I get into this and you recognize it. I'm in the middle of nowhere in Zambia. We're not in a city, we're way out there. And, uh, and we're sitting there next to this guy's hut. I'm sitting, we're both sitting on a log that's set up. And, um, and we're just talking. Uh, this guy, he, uh, we're, witnessing to him, you know, trying to get him to accept the Lord as his Savior. And in the middle of that, one of his responses is, well, I have idols inside here, and I can't give those up. Those are important to me. I have my idols. And so I, I mentioned in this passage in Isaiah where Isaiah says, this doesn't make much sense, does it? You go out and you cut down a tree. Then you cut off the best piece of wood, right? You select the best piece. You look up and down the tree and you say, this looks like a nice piece. And you cut that piece off. And you go ahead and carve it down, and you make an idol out of it. Now, the shavings that you got off the wood, you don't want to waste those, do you? So you put those in the fire, you make yourself a nice fire, and you cook your food on it, and you warm yourself. That's part of the log. And the other part of the log that you didn't carve off, you bow down to your God and say, please deliver me. And, I, and Isaiah says, that doesn't make much sense, does it? How does one half of it get burned in the fire, and the other half of it is a God to deliver you? Part of it cooks your food. The other part is going to deliver you? Really? And I mentioned that to this guy in Zambia who has idols in his house. I told him that whole thing, and he laughed. He thought it was funny. Okay? Um, which I'm going to say, the way Isaiah describes it, every time I read it, I laugh. I mean, it, you know, it's a humorous way of describing it. It's, it's just great irony. But the thing that was so fascinating to me about it, it's a little bit like, you know, sometimes we'll make fun of ourselves. Culturally, we'll say, you know, yeah, we're always whatever. I don't know. I can't even think of an example right now, but the kind of our human foibles, you know, that will, I don't know, forget our keys. I said this the other night. You ever walk around and you say, you know, where is my phone or where is my keys? And you look down in your hand and it's there. You know, those kinds of foibles. And we laugh at ourselves for our goofy things. That's the way this guy laughed. Kind of like, huh, yeah, yeah, it's goofy, isn't it? Oh, well, that's what we did. That was the thing with us. Okay? And, and, and that's the feel of this. They praise gods of gold and silver, brines, iron, wood, and stone. Okay, these are, these are empty, foolish gods. Why would you praise them? How are they going to deliver you? In contrast to that, immediately there came out the fingers of a man's hand, writing. I, I think this is intended to be a contrast, because look, they're praising, they're praising idols that don't move. Idols don't talk, they don't hear, they don't speak, they certainly don't write on walls. Okay, And, and while they're praising those dumb, mute totally empty idols, there came out the fingers of a man's hand and it was writing. Writing opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall. They dug this out and they found uh, in the king's palace, or an area that looks like the king's palace, where it's actually plastered. That was apparently a thing they did. Okay. And, and so this very well may be the room, that may be the area, who knows, where this writing happened. Okay. And the fact that it's recorded here, I mean, the first time I, when I was uh, translating, I thought, that's unusual. The lampstand uh, on the plaster of the wall. The idea of the lampstand would just be to say, it's, it's written in a place where everybody can see it. Okay? Everybody is seeing it. It's right in front. The king saw the palm of the hand which was writing. Nobody missed this. Then the king's countenance changed. His thoughts alarmed him. His hip joints gave way, and his knees knocked together. Uh, it's basically saying this guy was so scared, he couldn't hardly even stand up. Okay. Yes. I heard one interpretation where he actually like, um, how do I put this? Like his bowels gave way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Is that true? He was so more. scared he wet his pants. Yeah. Pretty, yeah. Pretty much. Like, is that true though? Like. No, no I think maybe okay. um, certain translations may may make you think that as a moderate. It's not a fault with the translation, but uh, as a modern reader, the way it's worded, you you think that's what it sounds like. Yeah. Uh, but from the Hebrew, it's actually hip joints. Okay. So it's not bowels the way that we use it. Like that's 
No, yeah. Yeah, it's not. <laughs> it made me think of that terrible feeling you got when you knew you were about to get it from your parents. Uh huh. When I was a kid. <laughs> yeah. Just, uh, and your legs get kind of cold and weak. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and uh, you know, now that we know more, or at least we think we know more about the situation, this makes more sense. Because, I mean, it's scary to watch a, a disembodied fingers writing on your wall. That's bad, but the, the whole situation that he's in at the time, too, and being kind of uh, more of a um, superstitious, not really religious, yep. that's got to be a bad sign while we're having a rally for all of a sudden a disembodied hand to write on the wall. Right, and... It's like, oh, we're dead. And these words that are down here, we'll come to them later, these words are Aramaic. Okay, the whole book is written in Aramaic. Uh, Belshazzar would definitely have spoken Aramaic. Okay, so he's, he's looking at those words, he's not sure how they should be interpreted, but he's got to think to himself, that doesn't sound good. <laughs> right? We'll come to the words in a bit, but that doesn't sound good. I don't think that means wealthy and happy for the rest of my days. Right? <laughs> Um, and there's discussion about, you know, why did he not understand it? Why did he need interpreters? And there are different theories, like maybe it was written this way instead of how it would normally be written, or from your side, from your perspective, this way. Maybe it was written up and down and things like that. I don't think any of that's necessary. I think it's pretty basic. He, if just these words without any context were written up here, we'll come to them. But if I just wrote them on the board, you'd be kind of like, okay, I'm not sure what that means. I don't think it's good, but I'm not sure what that means. Right? And that's why he would be calling for people. But that would also explain, I mean, it, I think it just makes sense instead of us going weird about, you know, was it written this way or what was it and all that. I, I think it explains why he's scared to death. I think it explains why verse 7 he's calling as loudly as he could. He's kind of hoping the guys will come up and they'll come up with some interpretation that means you're going to be healthy and fat and happy for the rest of your life. You know, I mean, he'd love for that to come. Come interpret this thing for me now. But he's kind of thinking, I don't think this is good. Right. And he's yeah. drunk, so it's probably radical. Like, you know, yeah. The emotions are way high, too. True, so true. He's going to way up Got to remember, yeah. he's probably pretty drunk. Yeah. Yeah, good. Very good. Um, sort of, you know, uh, somebody pulls, <laughs> if you're driving too fast, and you get pulled over to the side of the road, right? Okay, maybe he's coming up here to wish me a good day, but I don't think so. <laughs> okay. He's Sorry. also drunk. Right. He's not thinking. He's seeing hand. I mean, that would be terrifying in itself. Yeah. So... What is this? Somebody explain it. He calls as loudly as he could. Bring in, okay, by now, this should be getting, like, into a really familiar pattern. Okay? The go-to guys. Yeah, there's some kind of dream, vision, something. They don't know what to think it is. They call the guys. Okay? And the pattern's going to, it's going to, we're going to go all the way through. I mean, you know the story, but we just read it. But it's going to go all the way through. Call the conjurers, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers. Call the wise men of Babylon. Any man who can read aloud this writing, declare its interpretation, and I'll reward you. They all came in. They were not able to read the writing or make known the interpretation to the king. Okay, this is an old story. And of course, where this ends up is Daniel finally comes in, and Daniel interprets it. He's like, you would think that they would learn eventually. Uh, but of course, as we've already said, this is a different guy later on, many years later. And there, you know, we're going to see other reasons as well why he didn't call Daniel. But okay, old story. But this is familiar to us. Don't uh, comical. Yeah, it is. And I think it's supposed to be comical. Yeah. yeah. I think it's part of the humor of the way it's put together. Uh, anybody who can declare its interpretation will be clothed with purple and a chain of gold around his neck. This is actually um, definite. If you want, we can shut the door if that would help. I'm, I'm on the other side of the room, so it's not bothering me. Um, he'll be clothed with purple and the chain of gold around his neck, and he will rule third in the kingdom. The goal of the purple would have been kind of like the, the royal robes, okay? The gold chain, it is definite the instead of a. Uh. And, you know, I always thought, like, oh, cool, gold chain. Well, you know, gold's expensive, so we like having gold. Great. There's some indication that to have this gold chain was kind of like an official, um, I don't know, it's like almost having a badge, okay, on a uniform. Uh, but higher than that, okay? Uh, I gave the example in fast class of, like, a medallion. You know, a huge medallion with a seal on it, with a great big chain. That that is an image way of saying this guy's in charge, okay? Or you know, the judge puts on his robes, um, that kind of feel to things, okay? This was this was an exalted thing. If you wore the the gold chain, then you were the big important person. I think the message says something like, uh, "He'll have the special chain," you know, which is totally just adding words and making things up, and that's the problem with that. 
but uh, it also kind of expresses the idea, the special chain that says you're important. And to be ruling third in the kingdom. Okay, why third? Well, I told you, Nabonidus, Belshazzar, Daniel. So he's, that's why he's third. Because Belshazzar, basically, Belshazzar is giving him the highest possible office he can give him. He can't go any higher than that. Then all the king's wise men came in. They were not able to read. Belshazzar was greatly alarmed. His countenance changed. His lords were perplexed. I think verse 9, basically, uh, you could just put in there, the room fell apart. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Everybody's mixed up. Everybody's upset. They're a little inebriated, inebriated anyway. Uh, the whole room is just a mess. Okay? Party's ruined. The party's ruined. Party's ruined. The punch oh ball has been guys. carried out. This sucks. And verse 10, the reason I say that, the room fell apart, is because verse 10, when the queen walks in, the feel of that is that she's basically the only adult in the room. I say, you know, I don't mean like she's literally the only adult, but she's the only person who's actually being responsible and clear-headed. Maybe every, she's the only person that's not drunk, I don't know. She's the only person who, who's, okay, finally we have some order and some, some sense in the room. The queen, because of the words of the king and his nobles, entered the banquet. The queen answered and said, O king, left forever. You should not let your thoughts alarm you. There is a noble man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy God. I went ahead and translated that God. It could be God or gods. Either one is possible, and the grammar is the same. The underlying grammar uh, could be translated either way. Um, but, you know, I would suggest that she has some understanding uh, particularly if she was married to Nebuchadnezzar, that she has some understanding of Israel's God or the fact that Daniel uh, served one God, not multiple gods. Okay, so that's a real possibility. In the days of your predecessor, illumination, insight, and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, was found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your predecessor, made him chief of the magicians and conjurers and Chaldeans. Okay, we saw that, right? We saw the time that uh, he was made chief of those guys. Because the superior spirit, knowledge, and understanding to interpret all these dreams and visions and riddles and untangled problems were found in the stain of whom the king named Belshazzar.